the whole reason you go to a teacher is ironically to want to actually aim for so that one will not want you understand and that's I, I'm not joking here I'm not twisting any language or I'm not trying to be clever but that is the main aim isn't it I mean you that is the whole point of the uh, tantric uh, concept of guru you don't want to leave guru independently at the end I, I mean you don't want to leave the guru at, outside there as a, an external savior you want to realize your na your mind nature of your mind is the guru guru is only a bridge so ultimately wanting something from an external source is something that we have to eliminate okay well, it seems like though there's this point where people get stuck <laughs> Where intellectually they know what you're saying is mm -hmm. true, but they also have this kind of grasping yeah. quality towards the teacher. Yes, yes. Well, it's a very complicated relationship. Uh, like a Zen master said, to study Buddhism is to study uh, to study about yourself. To study Buddhism is to study about yourself. To study about yourself is to forget about yourself. Yes, that says it. To actually, the the ultimate aim of Dharma practice is to forget, not not to say forget. Actually, to really transcend, to go beyond all these distinctions. Now, that should be the fundamental base where we develop the student and teacher's relationship. But not many times it happens this way. Many times student and relationship is just another relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, man, woman. So that, that's why there's a game. Uh, when a student is insecure, students play games. When the guru is insecure also, gurus who are not accomplished, they have insecurity and they play games. Um, that's why, first of all, students don't go to a teacher seeking for something they need. Rather, they go there to look for something they want. Simil same, similar thing happens from the teacher too. Teach, more, many of us, many of the teachers like myself, we, we, are not, we are not even brave enough to really uh, give what the student really needs. And what, really, what student really needs could be very raw, very painful, very naked and who has courage to do that so difficult because many of us we have agendas agenda is the big problem in this world basically one should be agenda free we we do know that we have to crush our ego now in order to do that we somehow we have to uh, uh, see a model, so if you like, okay, a model who has done it, okay, and um, we have to admire that model. And when we admire, then there's father, there's the leader, there's all that thing, Buddha, whatever. So that's the only way to go. I mean, how would you teach someone in order to crush their ego? Uh, look, uh, look at your teacher as your maid. It won't work. 
But, but then Maybe for some very peculiar people. But it does work when you need to look upon as someone higher than you or someone, someone who is pu more pure than you. Is there a point where, where students can get stuck, though, as um, in a, like a parental relationship, not trusting their own? Oh, yeah, yeah, that can happen. That's what I was saying before. Many teachers have less, uh, many teachers don't have courage to give their children, their disciples, what they need because they have agenda. They want to give them what they want. And that can spoil them. That can make them emotionally dependent on them. Very much. That's a big responsibility for the teacher. If the teacher and the students are genuinely interested in the enlightenment, but if they, are, if they just want to build a relationship, yeah, that's the way to go. One should be more superior, the other always a little bit inferior, attempting to become, become superior, but always, uh, always one step behind. And that works. That's how the relationship works. Do you remember a point in your own practice where you stepped away from, that you went through this process? Seeing my teacher as human beings, seeing, seeing my teacher as impure and all of that, all the time, even now. Uh, the very, for instance, um, uh, hypocrisy that people like I have, doing some one thing in front of maybe a, a picture of my teachers and do something else behind, you understand? And that shows that there's a lack of acceptance that your teacher is the Buddha, he knows everything. There's no such thing as behind the picture or in front. How can we determine if a teacher is a genuine teacher? Um, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's very difficult, but um, I mean, especially as a deluded being, people like us, we can't, I mean, our judgment even we judge that someone is a really good teacher, how much can we trust with our own, ju our own judgment? Many times our own judgment has failed us. This is why in Buddhism, study, contemplation, not accepting Buddhism with blind faith, with blind devotion, is very much stress, especially in initially by the Buddha himself, again and again, Kanzala Mithun Cholatan, that's what he said, not to depend on a person, but depend on the teachings that he gave you. And not, not simple like that, you have to, it, it, will, it will always be an insurance, okay, if you like, to study, contemplate on the Buddhist texts, study them. And then finally, once you are slightly matured, I would say, you know, it's in this, even all the other quality failed, okay? Maybe your teacher is not a learned, maybe not, I don't know, a gentle, I don't know, straight enough, I don't know. But one thing that I think you should look for is some, a teacher, who is not interested in himself. A teacher who is totally interested in you and fellow sentient beings. Is there any value in Western students making a pilgrimage to Taksang or to Bodh Gaya? Yeah. Pilgrimage, although it has become very ritual now, it's sort of devotional, ritualistic thing.
the essence of going to all this pilgrimage is to remind ourselves that such beings exist not not as a hero okay not as a someone who has done this did this but as an example um but like even going to places like hiroshima probably can even it is a minute might remind you how we human beings destroy ourselves it's like that going to kushinagar for instance can remind you that life is impermanent even the buddha himself going to places like saranath can remind you that one of the greatest i'll just wait until that thing passes okay okay <laughs> one of the greatest thing that has been said in this world was said there and then it might invoke a little interest what did he say no the suffering abandon the cause of suffering and so on and so on so important you know to remind ourselves i mean of course if you are a good practitioner you don't need this need these things but um, i think uh, one should help ourselves with all kinds of help even it requires some kind of gross reminding reminder gross reminder like a, a you know holy land mountains trees whatever you know mm-hmm. it's like keeping um the nostalgia right that's the word i was looking for and nostalgia is a, can open a door to many things nostalgia can be a fuel for creativity here we are talking about nostalgia of an enlightened being and that may trigger the creativity in the sense of uh really valuing the dharma spiritual path and seeing a uh, futility of this worldly life devotion in buddhism is actually trusting in cause condition and effect is something that the scientists do if you cook an egg you need a certain cause and condition stove pot water fire gas whatever and if you have no obstacle egg will be cooked that's for sure and you can trust on that that's how for centuries people cooked the egg because of that and that trust in cause condition and effect is so called devotion in buddhism can you make can one make a movie without having an agenda mm-hmm. but you want to say something isn't it in the movie is not an agenda i think yes i think there is few directors who did that right without any script without any sort of not even knowing what's the what is it that they are going to shoot i have heard there are there are great directors who who has done and outcome is are actually quite amazing film i believe that we are so uh, stuck with um a certain lifestyle a lifestyle that needs to be arranged programmed it's getting worse actually our we are not we are getting further and further we are getting we are getting more and more distant we are from spontaneity um and that is really 
uh, creating all the big mess, I mean like uh, ecology. We are not happy uh, to spontaneously just camp under a cave or a tree. We need to now have a hotel, for instance. So the credit cards and all of that. We, are, we human beings, we ask for program life. And somehow we think that secures everything. And now it's too late. I mean, if you want an excursion fare ticket, you have to book an air ticket three months before. No more spontaneity, my dear. <laughs> my students, many of them take me very seriously and actually that is one of the greatest uh, living proof that karma does exist. Because here I am, out of nowhere, a Bhutanese, uh, and there are people, I mean, from United States, from Canada, from France, and these people are very sophisticated. They they are taught they are taught to think, they are taught to challenge. But now they are all sarcophant. They they will they just they believe everything what I say. This proves. The, these people have a lot of karmic debt with me and they have to pay that debt and uh, they will keep on believing in my word. Western students are very, very fresh. And that's a very, very big advantage. Um, Easterners, they, they they're more confident with the path and the, just because, you know, there's a trust. Because I guess it's the society. It's a, you know, like extended family, you know, if the mother is busy, you know, shopping, she can trust and live it with, like, the 14th uncle or the auntie, whatever, you know. So that, that, that also is within the Dhamma, you know, like, there is that trust. But, you know, you see the thing is, the very trust can also has its own disadvantage because then it becomes blind faith. The very freshness of the West, the freshness, the inquisitive, uh, what, what, what do you call it? Inqu inquisitive or skeptical, uh, they are very good quality. But then sometimes this can also go too far. You, you end up not practicing anything because you and you are just analyzing all the time. Okay. I'll ask one question. I'll, I'll stick my neck out here. Do students uh, consider you enlightened, Rinpoche? Do you consider yourself enlightened? Me? No, because. I am still a victim of condition. If I'm enlightened, then I shouldn't be. If the students keep on thinking that I'm enlightened, it will only benefit them, if there is benefit, that is. Okay. Uh, that's where the Buddhist teachings on mind comes in, you see. Everything is your mind. Um, Can you say a bit more about that, Rebecca? Huh? I know you've said it many times, other places, but just for purposes of this, it's like you know, it's like let's say you are, I don't know, you are in a bus or something, and person hop in, in the bus and sit next to you and this person may be, I don't know, going through a big problem. And you, without even you realizing, 
You didn't do anything. Maybe you just you just you just sat there, right? But somehow this person thinks that you have helped him a lot. I don't know by stepping over his toes or something. I don't know. Now he is not your healer or he is not your liberator. But the other person thinks so. You understand? And it will give the other person a sort of benefit. It can give the other person the benefit of keep on thinking that this person helps you. This this happens a lot. I you know I received so many thank you notes for from people you know thanking me for helping them because uh, when they were in this and that danger or not turmoil depression and honestly i tell you i i, I wasn't thinking about them at all like they would say oh thank you for your prayer you know now it's all okay sometimes i don't even know who the person is writing to me you understand let alone actually think them in the prayer similarly um this happens a lot actually this is something i should tell you because you know, as much as the student you know many people think the student has is more like a weaker weaker side and the power uh, the teacher is the power side isn't it sometimes it's not that true you, you know what i mean um uh, i think there's a word the teacher's side is the power uh, the uh, stage of uh, you know i mean you as a teacher you can control that's what people think but that's not necessarily true um for instance like um i have you know personally i had some problems with um some ladies whom i don't even know i don't i don't have any connection with them but um they think that i did you know like uh, maybe i might have smiled at them or shake hand with them or said something and they take it so seriously everything is your mind or interpretation of your mind everything is your imagination and there is nothing that is not an not an imagination therefore imagination is very powerful imagination is only reality that we have within the imagination there is a fantasy and the reality in the relative world buddhists in general they are trying to train people's mind to think on gentleness kindness love compassion and so on and so on that's all path but when you talk about everything as mind you are approaching to the ultimate truth ultimately yes as we approach to the ultimate truth first thing we have to realize is that then then we are not talking about path okay we are, you see don't bring the path in here when we talk about a path of course we have to talk, talk about goodness and badness and all that what needs to be abandoned what needs to be practiced but when as we approach to the ultimate then we don't talk this anymore we don't talk <laughs> we there's a good example a, a woman who desperately wishes to have a baby dreams that she is pregnant and even given birth she is so happy within the very same dream baby dies 
She's very unhappy. She wakes up. The happiness of the having the baby and the pain of the death of the baby are all gone. The third experience is what Buddhists are trying to aim. Not to, ha not to have the baby, not to, not to have the baby, but to go beyond that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. <Rappuché. laughs>